Let's learn more about what happened. Made their way into some kind of underground air pocket and then could not get out. Now, they did manage at one point to get a radio report out to their colleagues, and that began the process of pulling in debris. We don't know ex the exact sequence, but two men are known to be okay. You see one here getting some oxygen and treatment just after. And you hear the clapping, the cheers. The other one walks clear under his own power. Again, we don't know exactly how the men fell into jeopardy. We only know that their well-being tonight has become a rallying point for the disheartened but determined workers at the scene there. All right, now we want to go back out to the crash site. We were just there for the uh, FBI news conference that started at 4.30. Uh, we understand it is still going on, and uh, we're going to uh, check in with Mike and Michelle. Mike, Michelle? Yes, Sally, what we want to start with is telling you right off the bat what Special Agent FBI uh, Bill Crowley had to say to us. He emphatically ruled out any military involvement in this plane crash. Earlier a news conference, he told us that he wasn't ruling anything out, but then he emphatically said military involvement in this crash was ruled out. That's according to the FBI. He also said that right now there is no evidence of a second plane. We have been telling you how some witnesses around here said they saw a small, white, unmarked aircraft circling the area, circling the crash site, and then taking off. But Bill Crowley said at this point there is no evidence of that. Day three of the investigation was an incredible day of discovery for our Team 4 investigator Paul Van Osdal. You remember he discovered debris as far away as six miles from the scene. Well, today he met with a local woman who lives eight miles away who found debris in her backyard. He will have that report later on in our newscast. But the important thing, the FBI and the National Transportation Safety Board addressed that mystery. Why debris is being found so far away? Let's listen to what Special Agent Bill Crowley had to say. At the time of the, uh, the plane going into the ground, there was a nine knot wind in a southeasterly direction. Uh, both uh, New Indian and New Bal Indian Lake and New Baltimore are southeast of the crime scene. Uh, at that two and a half miles and eight miles. According to the NTSB, not only is it plausible that uh, the debris from this crash could be in these, both these locations, it is probable that they are. That <clears throat> One thing Special Agent Bill Crowley did not address in this news conference and in the other one this morning, uh, the black box. We have just learned that the black box has been located. It is in Washington, D.C. right now, and that will hold the key to this investigation, not only for the crash here in Somerset, but perhaps the three other hijacked planes. That's right. We wanted to get Mr. Crowley's reaction on that, and I'm turning around looking, waiting for him to come over. Actually, reporter Paul Van Osdal, you're just leaving the news conference. Did Mr. Crowley address the black box at all? We understand it's been recovered. Well, par partially recovered, Michelle and Mike. The, uh, the key thing is they found the flight data recorder. Now, that's distinct from the voice recorder. We're used to, after plane crashes, hearing the voice recorder, which is the black box, as you say, which records the final conversations between the pilot and the crew. They have not yet found the voice recorder, but they did find the data recorder, which is a crucial piece of evidence itself, because the data recorder records the final path of the plane. It gives data information, which will tell us exactly what the, the flight's flight was doing in the final minutes before the crash. These are orange in color. Aren't they together? Uh, no, they're two separate boxes. They're usually in the same place in the plane, but they've, they've only found the data recorder. And uh, Bill Crowley from the FBI would not say whether the data recorder was intact or not. However, he did say that the data recorder was found in the crater, which, of course, is where the plane went down. Did he say if, uh, it would tell us whether or not there had been an explosion? He did not say. They've not uh, been able to determine whether or not there was an explosion. And as we reported yesterday, one of the other things that came out in the news conference, when we talked about this evidence of a second plane in the area, they have not yet determined whether or not there was a second plane in the area at the time of the crash, uh, especially a military plane especially. There were two civilian aircraft within 25 miles. But as we reported yesterday, uh, people saw a, an unmarked plane, possibly a military plane, circling the crash scene at the time of the crash. They still don't have any information about where that plane came from. And before we let you go, let's um, talk about why it's so important to find the voice recorder again. It's going to tell them if there was a struggle or what might have happened? Oh, certainly. The voice recorder will have the uh, information, uh, both, both dramatic uh, information and very good information about what exactly happened in the final moments of the, before the crash, the, the dialogue, if there was any dialogue, between the pilot, the crew, and possibly the hijackers. So it's very important to have that voice recorder in addition to the data recorder. Incredible. All right, let's bring in our reporter, Susan right. Copen. Susan, if you could come over here. You've been looking at the issue of the black box most of the day. What can you tell us? 
Uh, well, the black box, I know that I talked to an aviation expert um, the other day. He said 90% chance there is going to be useful information sure. um, when they analyze that in Washington, uh, D.C. Now, today we had a chance to get to see the morgue that they're going to be setting up. That's about eight miles from here. It's located in Somerset Township. They're actually setting that up inside uh, the National um, Guard uh, Armory, which is located right on 281. They have this high-tech morgue that they actually transported here from Dallas. Dallas, Texas. Um, it has all state-of-the-art equipment that they're going to be using. Uh, 45 people died in this plane crash. Um, the coroner told us today earlier in a press conference that some remains um, of those victims of this plane crash uh, have been found. They are now being stored in a refrigerated uh, tractor trailer. But as of tomorrow, this morgue is going to be set up inside the National Guard Armory located on 281. Um, and right now there's about 30 to 35 people that are working with the coroner's office. Uh, that number will jump to about 100 people tomorrow. And Mike and Michelle, we're talking about experts from all over the country who are coming in to take a look at these remains and try to identify these people. It'll be so important, uh, not only for the investigation, but for the families. Those families, Susan and Michelle, are arriving. Uh, we were told earlier by Special Agent Crowley the families could be here tonight or tomorrow morning. That's right. That's right. We're going to check in right now with Marcy Cipriani. She is at Seven Springs Resort right. where all the families are gathering. Marcy, what can you tell us about the situation there at Seven Springs? Well, right now we do know that several rooms are available reserved here for families members of the victims of Flight 93 that we are told should be arriving here sometime tonight or tomorrow. Flowers are arriving from area businesses. They're waiting to greet the family. Counselors and Red Cross workers are also already on site to assist them with any questions and to help them deal with their loss as well as the grief of being so close to where the plane carrying their loved ones went down. Um, we have many trained professionals here now. We'll bring in more as we need them, um, and we're going to make sure that the families are, are taken care of um, and provide that psychological first aid that they may need at this time. At this hour, though, the Red Cross is only on standby. I am told so far no family members have arrived here at Seven Springs. They also tell me when they do arrive, of course, there's going to be a long line of people, including investigators and the Red Cross counselors, who will want to talk with them. They say they may be available to the media sometime tomorrow. Reporting live, I'm Marcy Cipriani. Back to you. All right, Marcy, we appreciate that. We are going to get more from the crashing there in Stony Creek Township, but we have a lot more to cover on our local look at the impact here. That's right. As you've seen with these news conferences in Somerset, the FBI is not saying anything about the investigation. It's all coming from the Attorney General, John Ashcroft's office, and Washington. Uh, it, they're being very quiet also about whether they intend to arrest a Middle Eastern doctor from the Newcastle area. But this has been a, a major focus of our uh, investigations here in the last 24 hours. Agents we do know searched the apartment of a radiology surgeon who lived in the Shannock Township, Lawrence County, and they searched it early this morning. Our investigative reporter Jim Parsons is joining us now with the latest that we know about this man and what they've investigated. It's really bizarre. It is strange and still not a lot of answers, but we do know more about uh, Dr. Hussein's background, Scott and Sally. Federal investigators are still not saying why they searched the apartment of Dr. Bassem Mufasa Hussein early today. Hussein has reportedly been traced to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the FBI office there confirmed to Team 4 today that they are helping federal agents in Pittsburgh with this investigation. Meantime, Team 4 has learned that until just last month, Hussein was practicing medicine in Butler. The Meadows apartments near Newcastle were quiet today, just a few hours after local, state, and federal police finished seizing belongings from the apartment of Dr. Bassem Hussein. Hussein lives here, but he most recently worked 20 miles east in Butler, where American flags adorn Main Street today, and retailers have signs that read, God bless America. Butler Memorial Hospital spokesman John Reggetti tells Team 4 Hussein was hired here in early July on a temporary basis to work in the radiology department. He apparently quit the job August 10th. One employee of the radiology department at Butler Memorial declined to go on camera but tells Team 4 that what struck her about Dr. Hussein is that in a six-week period this summer, he never said one word to her, not even returning her greeting in the hallway. Sources at the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service say Dr. Hussein is not a naturalized citizen of the U.S. Here's what we know about him. He graduated from the University of Ottawa Medical School in Canada in 1990. He first showed up in the U.S. one year later in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he obtained a residency card. He did his medical residency at New York Medical College north of New York City.
In 1997, he lived in Ross Township and practiced neuroradiology at Allegheny General Hospital. In 1999, he was hired by Jameson Hospital in Newcastle. That ended in early 2000. So he went more than a year without a job until he got hired on at Butler Memorial this summer. Now, the FBI office in Albuquerque, New Mexico, says it may make an announcement in this case later today. But for now, FBI supervisory agent Doug Belden in Albuquerque says they have made no arrests and they have conducted no searches. Scott and Sally? Well, just because you have a, a, a foreign last name, uh, why would that be of interest? What got the FBI investigating this guy? Well, employ that's, a, that's a good question. Employees of uh, his Newcastle apartment complex reportedly told FBI agents they were concerned about his recent disappearance after the, uh, the terrorist attacks the other day, and so they went into his apartment. Now, the Associated Press reports that those employees told police they found Arabic literature in his apartment, as well as flight manuals and computer software that had to do with flying a commercial airliner. And we checked today and found uh, no uh, pilot's license being held by Dr. Hussein. You know, it, it's just this eerie and frightening thread that runs through all of these investigations, the, uh, the computer, the Arabic literature, flight manual. And, it, and again, he has not been charged with anything. And this may, uh, one FBI agent told us they are running down hundreds of leads. Sure. And so this may be one of those leads that goes nowhere. It may go somewhere. Right. We're st still waiting to hear. And again, the FBI office in Albuquerque says they may make an announcement with this later today, but so far have made no arrests. So, and if there's not a con connection, he just may be a, clearly an unfriendly guy, but an unlucky guy just to get it swept up in this. Exactly. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much, Jim. Well, they're not exactly flying high, but the nation's airports are back in business, but only a fraction, a fraction of what would be normal, Scott. That's indeed true, Sally. It started the go-ahead given just before noon. It may be a day or two before we see regular air traffic as we know it. We're going to continue our coverage and go out to Pittsburgh International, where Sheldon Ingram has been uh, standing on that front today. Sheldon. Yeah, that tragedy on Tuesday is still taking a devastating effect on the air traffic. Pittsburgh International said it will operate a minimal number of flights today. So far at this hour, only seven flights have taken off from the airport. U.S. Airways said it will operate uh, some of its flights starting at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So far, only one U.S. Airways flight has taken to the air from Pittsburgh International. That occurred at 5 o'clock this afternoon, just a few minutes ago. Now, although passengers are being told by some of the airlines to come and to make their flights, they're finding out when they get here that the status of those flights is still questionable. Pittsburgh International Airport is trying to regain a sense of normalcy. Easier said than done. This is what greets travelers arriving at the airport. Continued cancellations. Bill and Pam Weissup are desperate to get back home to Tampa. They're actually thinking about buying a used car to get there. If we can't get our plane right now uh, secured, we're going to go off and, uh, and, and buy a used car down here in, uh, in Pittsburgh and drive it home and sell it. Rent a car was uh, a dollar a mile from here to Tampa, about 1,100 plus miles. Plus the rental fee. Plus the rental fee and plus your insurances and all. So you're talking a very expensive deal, almost $2,000. Gary Chobin didn't want to wait for flights to open up either. Chobin, like thousands of other airline passengers, rented a car and drove back to Pittsburgh. Chobin drove 10 hours from Raleigh, North Carolina. I couldn't wait it out. I had to get back for business tomorrow, and uh, I drove uh, a little bit last night and then finished the rest of it this morning. Passengers expected to fly out tonight should arrive two hours before scheduled departures. With security at its highest level at Pittsburgh International, expect carry-on luggage to be opened and inspected at the security checkpoint. Also, the FAA says only passengers holding tickets are permitted beyond the checkpoint area. Expect aircraft security sweeps and no knives of any material, even plastic, are allowed on flights. Um, it's understandable due to the circumstances. I think it's understandable. Keep in mind that Pittsburgh International Airport right now is operating at the highest level of security since it opened nine years ago. Straight ahead at 6 o'clock, we will show you some of the security measures that are in place that the public will have to endure when coming out here. Reporting live from Finley Township, Sheldon Ingram, Channel 4 Action News. Sheldon, we, we may have missed this because we're getting information in, in our ears, uh, uh, but I don't know if you have mentioned how long they expect you to have to 
uh, wait or take before you get on your flight? You know, here to four, they say get there an hour beforehand. What are they telling people now? Yeah, the, 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 the word right now, Sally, is for the public to arrive at the airport at least two hours before uh, your scheduled departure. Now, given the flow of traffic and all of the gridlock with everyone bottlenecking in here wow. at the same time, you might want to even give yourself an extra hour on top of that. Not to even mention traffic on the parkway trying to get out here. We're it, talking about three hours. Yeah. All right, you're already seeing that back up now. It's already yeah, the bottleneck is underway. Well, people have been coming in all afternoon, but uh, they're realizing that some of their flights aren't going to make it out tonight. The steady of the flow of traffic really isn't as heavy today as they expect tomorrow. Everyone knew that the uh, Pittsburgh International Airport would release only a minimal number of flights today, but tomorrow everyone's expecting a full operation of flights coming and going out of Pittsburgh International, and that's when they really expect the gridlock to occur. All right. Thanks very much. Sheldon Ingram, live from Pittsburgh International Airport. We had been waiting to see when air traffic would resume. We were also waiting this week to hear about some plans for the weekend, and we got the announcement just before noon. There will be no NFL football this weekend. The NFL says week number two is off. That means the home opener at Heinz Field against the Cleveland Browns is going to have to wait. Andrew Stocky is here. Andrew. That's right, Sally and Scott. As you mentioned, the NFL will not play this weekend, but they have not decided whether they're going to cancel all the games or make them up at a later date. We should know sometime next week. Either way, that scheduled clash between the Steelers and Browns at Heinz Field Sunday night will not happen. The Steelers left the field, knowing the historic nature of the league's decision not to play Sunday. I, I, I really feel that, uh, that that's a, something that that we've lost and uh, you know I I, I, I'm, I feel badly that uh, that it did happen but under the circumstances I completely understand it the league also understood understood the reluctance among its players to play a feeling that is far from unanimous in the Steeler locker room I can't say it was 50 50 it wasn't a yes no thing it was some guys who were who were felt they could go out and play there are other guys that were really not feeling like they could get, uh, get their job done on Sunday. It would have been extremely difficult uh, to realize that you have to focus on, on the game of football and knowing that, that what is going on up there, it, it really would be difficult. It's been difficult to focus all week and we're down here. The Steelers plan to shut down their offices here on the south side tomorrow in observance of the National Day of Mourning. But the black and gold team will be together. They will board a bus and head to the memorial service for the victims of the plane crash in Somerset County. But their coach still wonders, what if his team did take the field on Sunday? Maybe handing everybody a little American flag and seeing 65,000 flags waving and, um, you know, it would have been, uh, I don't know, national anthem being sung. I think, I mean, I get chill bumps thinking about it. Well, the NFL's decision has opened the floodgates this afternoon. Major League Baseball says it will not resume action until Monday. All Division I college football games are now postponed, including those in the SEC, Big 12, and Big 10, which originally were playing to play this weekend. And the WPIL is asking its schools not to play football tomorrow night. Now, many games have been shifted to Saturday. We suggest you call your local high school to find out if your team is going to play this coming Saturday or they will move it to a later date. Sally Scott. All right. Thanks very much, Andrew. Well, you're not going to be hearing cheers for Sports. The cheers you're hearing today are for the rescue crews working in New York at this hour. A team from Allegheny Valley is there. They're at ground zero, seven to random firefighters helping however they can. And one of them talked to Action News via cell phone earlier today. Emily Ryan's in the newsroom with his story. It has to be incredible, Emily. It is incredible, Sally. Six men and one woman from Eureka Fire and Rescue arrived in New York City yesterday. Today, they actually witnessed the sight of those fellow firefighters freed from the rubble. One thing the chief says surprised him how large an area is destroyed. He compared it to the size of downtown Pittsburgh. <laughs> Driven by images like these, seven Tarentum firefighters head to New York and find a situation far worse than they feared. From his cell phone in lower Manhattan, Chief Richard Heuser sets the scene. I'm not new to this type of, of uh, thing, uh, certainly not on this magnitude or scale. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. It is the most horrific thing that I've ever seen. Uh, many people here, Vietnam War veterans, uh, uh, Korean War veterans that say that uh, this simply uh, is unparalleled to anything that they've seen. Uh, it, it's just horrendous. He and his team brought along an ambulance and rescue truck. They're working on Tower 7 of the World Trade Center. For uh, about
throughout the first four hours last night, uh, we were functioning as a rescue squad, operating with one of uh, New York City's power ladder companies and uh, one of their engine companies, uh, trying to uh, suppress the fire uh, on the Park Street side of uh, Tower 7 collapse. The side that we're on presently it has been uh, determined to be unsafe because of an imminent collapse of uh, yet another structure. Uh, as a matter of fact, as we speak, uh, they're in the process of demolishing it so that uh, uh, they can make access to the rear of the Tower 7 collapse. It is incredibly dangerous, but something Terenum firefighters felt they had to do. The fire service is a great brotherhood. Ten years ago when we lost four firefighters in Brackenridge, uh, New York City sent a contingent over to help us honor them. Uh, this is pay. Back home, empty coat hooks serve as visual reminders of their courage, while friends await their safe return. He said in the last uh, 48 hours, they've got about three hours of sleep uh, laying across the table. Uh, that they pulled out of an old abandoned store that was there and uh, obviously I'm concerned you know with their their general health and well-being concerned and proud God be with them the chief also talked about security in New York he says he went through five checkpoints and of course had to show ID before getting anywhere near the scene live in the newsroom I'm Emily Ryan Sally back to you they have described it as hell and it must be that thanks very much Emily if the call for help comes, Pittsburgh firefighters are ready to answer it. More than 700 have signed up and are ready to go when needed. The camaraderie that we have, you know, around this country, this nation, even in Canada, is that when firefighters go down or unfortunately die, I mean, we're always there to assist and do whatever we can, especially in this disaster relief. Well, when you think about what they said, this uh, a disaster area the size of downtown Pittsburgh, you see the scale. Uh, needed to, uh, the, I mean, the amount of uh, money and manpower is going to be staggering, but we are helping. Uh, in just the uh, two days here, we've seen a way of meeting the need. Oh boy, have we. Action News is taking action. So proud Pittsburghers and people from all over Western Pennsylvania can give what they can. Stephen Cropper in Studio A tonight. Well, I hear the ring right now, Stephen, and boy is that sweet. Our Salvation Army phone bank and a call for you to pick up the phone. That's right, Sally. Through the day, you've probably noticed the number across the bottom of the screen, 412-243-6000. And I must say, this is one of the most humbling experiences I've ever been a part of. So far, $162,000 has been raised just since yesterday for the relief effort. All of the money then in turn going to the Salvation Army to be dispersed to New York, to Washington, and also to be used here in Pittsburgh and up in Shanksville. Just a couple of stories that have come in through the day. Uh, Colonel DeMichael with the Salvation Army was just talking to the folks in New York. Apparently Home Depot offers to give uh, picks and shovels and so the Salvation Army says well we're not sure exactly what we can do with those. They say we'll take them anyway. So they drive them into New York. As they're getting to New York they see the crews coming out with broken picks and shovels. Divine timing. The picks and shovels were then used to continue the relief efforts. More than a thousand uh, relief workers working in New York alone. All of this money again going to New York, to Washington, uh, to the <laughs> Pentagon area, and then also here in town. The Emergency uh, Command Center has been operating and up in Shanksville. Your chance to help out. If you've been at home watching the TV, watching through the afternoon, or listening to uh, the radio reports, this is your chance to say, hey, I can do something tangible. If you want to give uh, your help monetarily, give a call to 412-243-6000. If you are interested in finding out about how to donate your time, if you're looking to provide some volunteer service, call that same number. The Salvation Army workers here have information on that as well. Sally and Scott, through the evening, we'll be updating you on the uh, re results here, as well as some other stories that are going on. I know myself, you, uh, you watch and you feel helpless. This is a chance for you to help out. Sally, Scott. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that, Stephen. I know uh, some people in the uh, financial community have, are, are circulating uh, emails uh, saying one of the best ways to strike back at these terrorists will be financially by buying stock when the markets open on Monday interesting way of looking at it. And buying airline tickets too. Yeah, indeed. Understood. All right, thanks very much. Now, we want to look at what's happened, the latest stuff that we've got. Remains found at Somerset crash site, and we also know that the victims' families are headed to Seven Springs. They're going to be lodged there. And the Flight 93 data recorder has been located and is on its way to Washington, if not already there. The FBI believes that there were at least 18 now, 18 hijackers involved in the attacks and that a significant number of others may have taken part in the planning. 
All right, five each on two planes, four each on the others. And from the beginning, we've talked about Osama bin Laden as a possible mastermind here. And there are some new reports that he headed for a new hiding location within minutes of the terrorist attacks. So with more on the bin Laden uh, aspect of this and the search for suspects, we're going to go uh, to Boston now. And reporter Marnie McLean, who we've been talking to from our sister station, is joining us now. Good evening, Marnie. Well, good evening, Scott and Sally. Uh, as you said, we are continuing to learn new details about the movements of the suspected terrorists before they boarded the planes in Boston. Now, according to the FBI, as you just mentioned, there were a total of 10 hijackers who left Logan Airport, five on each doomed flight. Sources have told us on the Sunday night before the attack, suspected terrorist Mohammed Atta rented a car from Alamo at Boston's Logan Airport. He reportedly drove that car to Portland, Maine. Police found it at the airport. It's now at the state crime lab. Investigators believe the suspects left Portland at 6 a.m. Tuesday morning and flew to Boston. A piece of luggage that didn't make its connection was searched inside a Saudi passport and international driver's license. Sources also say the suspects purchased seven airline tickets with the same visa card. It's that card that led heavily armed police to this downtown Boston hotel yesterday. Three people were questioned, but later released. At Logan Airport, the first sign of normal, a plane in the sky. This one headed to Newark, but no passengers on board. Airport employees wait outside while security teams sweep the terminals. They're being trained on strict new procedures and say we'll all need to find a new definition of normal. We're going to need a lot of time, a lot of time. It's not going to be easy boarding these flights anymore. It's going to be a lot of security once again. Back to the investigation now. We have also learned that there is surveillance tape of some of the suspected terrorists going through security at the airport in Portland, Maine. Apparently there is video of them going through and picking up their carry-on shoulder bags and this was apparently just seven minutes before their flight was scheduled to take off at six o'clock in the morning. Clearly they've left behind a lot of clues here in New England. Investigators are just hoping it's going to lead them that to whoever is behind this, whether it is Osama bin Laden or someone else. For now, we're putting live in Boston. I'm Marnie McLean. Scott Sally, back to you. Marnie, let me just ask you real quick, and I don't know if you do know, but what about these reports that bin Laden has family, relatives, who have significant financial holdings in the Boston area, real estate and such? I can tell you just a very little bit about that. Some reports that his family does own some condominiums in the Boston area. I can't really elaborate much on that. Um, I do think we're going to have a crew head over there and see what they could find out. Obviously, it's going to be probably pretty difficult to get some information. But, of course, if I'm able to find anything, I will pass it along to your station. Absolutely. All right. Marty McLean in Boston tonight. We thank you. We also have some developments to note. This one out of Arkansas tonight. Earlier today, the FBI issued an all-points bulletin. For a woman wanted for questioning related to the New York City terrorist attacks, she was picked up near Fort Smith, Arkansas, taken to the FBI offices in Smart Fort Smith. Shortly afterwards, she left with two FBI agents. They went to her apartment. They removed several items, including a computer. A few minutes later, agents and police came out a back door of the FBI office with a man in handcuffs. They are not releasing many details about that. The FBI's massive investigation stretches from Canada to Arkansas to Vero Beach, Florida. A lot of activity in Florida where some of the terrorists allegedly learned how to fly commercial airplanes. Today, FBI agents interviewed three Saudi Arabian flight engineers who are taking classes at the school there. Agents confiscated flight training books and manuals, and they raided a rental car company. We're going to have more on the Florida connection live later in our broadcast. On crossing the Atlantic, police in Germany say they're looking for a second man in connection with the terrorist attacks. An employee at the Hamburg airport is already detained for questioning. ABC's Adora Udoji has that part of the story. German investigators have quickly picked up the trail of at least two suspected terrorists. Spurred by a tip from the FBI, overnight German SWAT teams raided eight apartments. They arrested an airport worker who was carrying an Egyptian passport and detained a woman for questioning. We had uh, some persons who lived in Hamburg legally, who studied usually in uh, Technik, and uh, they left Hamburg in Germany some month ago. They believe one of them was 33-year-old Mohammed Atta of the United Arab Emirates, who lived in Germany for six years before going to Venice, Florida, where he took flying lessons. And the Boston Globe reports he was booked on American Airlines Flight 11 in seat 8D. 
That plane blasted into Tower 1 of the World Trade Center. We hope that this will be a good support for getting all the persons who are involved in this big crime. Support is coming from all over Europe. In Rome, police report on April 2nd, at least one uniform was stolen from an American Airlines pilot. The FBI is said to be looking for a connection. At Buckingham Palace, there was a moment of silence honoring the victims. British authorities say the terrorists in New York killed at least 100 Brits and probably many more lie buried in the rubble. In their memory, Queen Elizabeth ordered a special changing of the guard to mark a day of mourning. Adora Udoji, ABC News, London. And we, we understand that in England they played our national anthem. Americans aren't the only victims of Tuesday's attacks. Hundreds, perhaps thousands, are foreigners. As in the case with the overall count, the numbers of foreigners among the missing remains unclear. According to Japan's foreign ministry, about 100 Japanese nationals, including dozens of tourists, are unaccounted for. At least 50 Bangladeshis are confirmed dead. Many more are reported missing. Britain's casualties appear to be even heavier, as you just heard, approaching 100. Some 27 South Koreans are listed as missing, and nine Australians are confirmed dead. 85 remain missing. As rescue and recovery work continues in all three locations, we're beginning to learn about the victims uh, even more, not just the names on the lists, but more about the husbands and the wives, brothers, sisters, friends, all lost. Minutes before the United plane went down in Pennsylvania, Fort Myers, Florida police officer Lauren Lyle's phone rang. It was his wife, Cece, an attendant on Flight 93. To hear my wife tell me she loved me through all the chaos, that probably was going on on that plane, to call me to tell me she loved me what is embedded in my heart. Cece Lyles also had two sons. That plane that slammed into the Pentagon carried heartbreak for families all around Washington. Three children and their teachers selected to take part in a National Geographic Ecology Conference were on board. Hilda Taylor taught elementary school. She was the best sixth grade teacher ever. Also on board, a family of four beginning a journey to Australia, where Leslie Whittington, a Georgetown University professor, was going to teach. She sure as hell touched me. She um, was an energetic, powerful, dynamic, strong-willed, passionate, caring lady with a dynamite sense of humor and love of life. And God, she is a loss to humanity. A flight attendant on board, Michelle Heidenberger, died. Her family said a hero, putting her passengers and crew first. Michelle is, is or was a very sweet woman and uh, has two children. At the Pentagon, in an office now in ruins, Rosemary Chapa worked as an intelligence analyst. Minutes before impact, she called her daughter and left a message. She just said, hi, darling, give me a call. That was it. Rosemary Chapa has not been heard from since. The Archbishop of Washington said today his family has not heard from Michael Lynch, a New York City firefighter. He uh, apparently went in early, one of those uh, companies that went er in early, and uh, I guess he must have been in the building when it collapsed. Archbishop McCarrick says he was supposed to preside at his cousin's wedding later this year. Also in New York, the victims number John Oganowski, a father of three, the pilot of Flight 11. It's hard to explain losing your big brother. There are, of course, many, many more victims. Today, the airlines released the full flight manifest of names of the passengers, the pilots, and flight attendants on all four doomed planes. Watching the, watching the uh, this is, uh, we have all kinds of reactions, and we're going to, as our news continues, talk about other ways you can contribute uh, monetarily and also ways that you can give. Uh, we want to get some of the information, though, that's coming out of our nation's capital today, some of the response of the administration, what the president is saying. That's right. We're going to go to Lori Kenny right now, live in Washington. Lori? Hi, Scott and Sally. Well, emotions continue to run high and security continues to be tighter here in Washington, D.C. today. Meantime, officials are talking recovery and they're talking retribution. Tuesday's attack has drawn many comparisons to another deadly day. December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed. You know what we said? Where the hell is Pearl Harbor? We may not have known where it was, but what happened there made us mad. And like Tuesday, pulled us together. Understood. That is uh, Sam Merrill, obviously, and he sounds nothing like Lori Kinney. And he's, Sam is going to look have a good story about what's uh, our response, the patriotic response. But right but, now we're going to go exactly. back to Lori. Thanking the 
police and President Bush began the day with a call to New York's governor and the mayor of New York City. The president praised rescuers and promised to speed up benefits to the families of fallen firefighters and police. The president's mood clearly emotional. This country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy that came upon America. The president and first lady then visited victims of the Pentagon attack in a Washington hospital. At the military nerve center, defense officials say it is no longer a rescue mission, but a recovery effort. Meantime, on Capitol Hill, calls for a formal declaration of war threw lawmakers into uncertain territory as they wrestled with how to confront a shadowy enemy. We're in a new world. Uh, the, the, a lot of the concepts that we have dealt with in the past have been with the normal situation where one country attacks another. Lawmakers also worked on the president's request for $20 billion toward relief and security efforts. As the investigation into the attack moved forward, Secretary of State Colin Powell for the first time confirmed Osama bin Laden as a suspect. Others were questioned as far away as Germany and at U.S. flight schools where hijackers may have trained. There were reports that one trainee and suspect had been identified as this man, Mohammed Atta. The FBI is working thousands and thousands of leads. But it was also a day for signs of recovery as U.S. airports began to reopen. That's right, and it was a day of continued hope in New York for a miracle that perhaps more survivors might be pulled out of the rubble there. Now, President Bush has declared tomorrow, Friday, a national day of prayer and remembrance for the victims of Tuesday's attacks. Reporting live from Washington, Lori Kinney, Channel 4 Action News. Scott Sally. Lori, well, one of the major developments here in Pittsburgh is that we have apparently found the flight data recorder from the plane that went down here, but we're also hearing that they may have at least found a location for the black box at the Pentagon. That's right, Scott. Investigators believe they have detected a signal from that black box. They haven't been able to get close enough yet to find out, though, that portion of the building, uh, as you know, demolished. However, they are hoping they can get closer this evening, as early as tonight, so we may get some more information soon. Scott? Uh, that's hopeful. All right, Lori, thank you for that. All right, now we're going to switch gears back as, as we've been moving from satellite to satellite here and to talk about this patriotic response because we do feel helpless as we not only watch the initial attacks but even the frustrating process of rescue. And many Americans are anxious to do something. It's led to a wonderful display of patriotic pride not seen since the Gulf War. Sam Merrill explains. Tuesday's attack has drawn many comparisons to another deadly day. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed. You know what we said? Where the hell is Pearl Harbor? We may not have known where it was, but what happened there made us mad. And like Tuesday, pulled us together. Understated, unspoken patriotism became visible and vocal. In Dormont, it's taken the unmistakable form of old glory. Hundreds of flags lining blocks of city streets. Each morning they put them up, at night they take them down. For how long, nobody seems to know. It's a good idea. My boy has ours on. And so do many others. Look around, you got the flags everywhere, you have all these people volunteering. I mean, the blood donations are up like, I don't know how much, hundreds of percent. I mean, everyone just wants to help out. And I mean, it, it takes actions like these to really show like the strength of the human spirit. In addition to streets lined with flags, strangers line up to give blood. It's the kind of things that happen whenever America is in trouble. But then the crisis fades. We're so caught up in our lives and our everyday, you know, going to work, going to school, doing this or that, you know, and it just, you know, when this happens, you realize what's important, you know. So we take it for granted. We take the freedoms that we have and the safety that we thought we had for granted because we're used to it. And we don't think about, until some tragedy like this happens, we don't think about how important it is. We have gotten a flood of emails, suggestions, ways to keep patriotism going. A viewer that wants us to light a candle for unity by lighting a candle or lantern tonight, showing the world that our spirit burns bright. Sean Eleven wants a giant simultaneous Pledge of Allegiance, a giant expression of being one people. This viewer wants Pittsburghers to flip the switch on their porch lights Saturday to show support for victims and the heroes who tried to save them. And Lynn 90 wants a Friday night show of solidarity, a candle lighting to show the world we are strong and united. Of course, we want to hear from you. Email us at the Pittsburgh Channel or take part in one of our polls or forums. A different display of patriotism and grief in Washington County today. Two flags fly at half-staff as neighbors in Washington come by to leave roses and other flowers on the courthouse steps. And in Cannonsburg, 
The flag is at half staff at the municipal building. People there are also leaving flowers and even cards. One card reads, God bless America, please. Well, we understand that we have the opportunity right now to speak to the gentleman that uh, Emily, Ryan, Emily talked to earlier today on the phone, Chief Richard Hauser, I think, Hoiser, Hoiser, Chief Richard Hoiser, was one of the Tarentum fire chiefs who was in New York right now. Yeah, and I believe, Chief, you're joining us on the, on the phone line, and, uh, and your, your guys may have been a part of witnessing what happened when some of the firefighters became trapped today, is that what I understand? Uh, we didn't actually witness it, no, it was... Um, uh actually about uh, seven or eight hundred feet from where we were working. Well, tell us uh, what, we you, work what, what did you see? Uh, actually what we were doing today is we were working uh, behind the Tower 7 collapse area uh, in the collapse zone with, the, with uh, some of the NYFD personnel. Uh, they're attempting to uh, bring down a building in that area so that we can get in and start searching the Tower 7 area. Uh, right now it's off limits because of an imminent collapse of, of another building. Can, can you tell us, Chief Hoiser, um, with, with that rescue that you could see at some distance, um, can you tell us what was the feeling? Because it has been not hopeless, but there's been so much despondency and frustration because there haven't been, been any discoveries of people alive. So what was it for that moment? Can you tell us? Certainly any time that, that anyone is brought out alive out of, out of this nightmare, uh, you know, it definitely boosts everyone's spirits. Uh, uh, it, it's it's an up note. It's an up note in a in a very dismal situation. Your your team has been moved back, as you say, because there's a possible imminent collapse. Uh, if there isn't all clear, what exactly is your team doing? Is this debris removal, or are you looking uh, to recover remains? We were actually functioning as a rescue squad company with uh, NYFD. Uh, several of their squad companies uh, were taken out of service in the collapse. Uh, so we're operating as a squad company uh, with the NYFD at the present time. Uh, difficult Chief, work. Yeah, Chief, um, we heard from one of your co-workers this morning, Emily interviewed him, that uh, they had, they'd heard that you had only gotten about three hours sleep in 48 hours. How are you holding up? Well, we're doing pretty good. We've rotated out now. Um, uh, we just checked out the, the command post. Um, they have basically told us that, um, you know, as soon as uh, we can get some sleep and get some rest, we're to report back to the command post for reassignment. Uh, the normal shifts for the rescuers up here are putting about, uh, they, they try to get them rotated on a three-hour shift, but again, uh, due to the shortage of the squad companies, um, we just came off a 24-hour shift. All right, well, you, you, you make your company very proud, and, and all of us in western Pennsylvania. Thanks very much for joining us, Chief. Thank you very much. They had 90 uh, bomb scares in, in Manhattan today, and they are common at this time, and we understand that one of them has resulted in just the last few minutes in the evacuation of the United States Senate. So the United States uh, senators and their staff members being moved out of that portion of the Capitol building. And that uh, chamber actually became the scene of some of the strongest words out of Washington this week. Some of them from Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum, who denounced the terrorists for turning our domestic airplanes into what he called enemy missiles. Senator Santorum called that day for disproportionate response. Now, earlier today, during a live interview, I asked him to define that. Well, I think it's very, very important to understand that terrorism is not, you know, out there in a vacuum. Uh, the terrorist cells operate in countries, and there are countries in this world who let them operate, uh, principally because of fear. Now, some do it because they agree with them, but most let them operate out of fear uh, for things that could happen to their own government if they were to take any kind of retaliatory measures against or try to move these terrorist cells out of their country. Uh, we have to make it, to, to, we have to tell those countries and, and punish those countries who, are, who cooperate with terrorists to the point where their fear of us is greater than the fear of the terrorists. And uh, that's one thing. The other thing is we have to understand, we have to make it very clear that if you're going to attack the United States, we are going to take disproportionate retribution and we're going to, we're going to conduct a, a, a mission that is going to be uh, f by hopefully many times worse punishment on them than they ever leveled upon us. Unless we do those two things, we will not be able to effectively combat terrorism uh, because simply the price to the, the terrorists pay uh, will never be as great as what they inflict. And if that's the case, they will continue to do it. 
this is not going to be a one-time limited strike uh, on on a couple of targets in in a, in a particular country. That that we've done that, and and it doesn't work. What we have done is embolden. Uh, terrorist organizations by dropping a bomb here and a bomb there saying, you know, gee, you guys are bad. That is not how we're going to uh, defeat terrorism. And what this is about, what we have to understand is we must take on and defeat terrorism because if we do not, this is just one avenue that they can attack the United States. We can do all the airport security we want and they'll find another avenue because there are avenues available uh, that, that our country is not defended against. The only great, only, only true defense against terrorism uh, is to keep them moving so fast and keep their head on a swivel so, so much that they can't p spend the time to worry about attacking us. That, to me, is uh, what we have to do. And that's not going to take a month. Frankly, it won't even take a year. This is going to be a long-term uh, commitment to this country in a major way to protect our shores. We're going we're to find out who it is, and they will pay. Senator Rick Santorum during a live interview earlier today on this station. We also heard today for the first time from former President George Bush, the 41st president. Speaking to a group of business leaders in Boston, Mr. Bush urged Americans to be patient and to learn from Tuesday's attacks. Uh, it's going to take time. There's no question. American people want instant action. Uh, it's going to take time on this against this faceless enemy, just as it took plenty of time uh, to stand down uh, Saddam Hussein uh, in the Gulf many years ago. Well, just as Pearl Harbor awakened this country from the notion that we could somehow avoid the call to duty and defend freedom in, in Europe and Asia in World War II, so too should this most recent surprise attack erase the concept in some quarters that America can somehow go it alone uh, in the fight against terrorism Mr. Bush says his son, the president, has a great national security team, and they have been doing, in his words, the right thing. There are countless dramatic stories coming out every hour. This is among the most horribly ironic. An Irish man reports his brother was on the ground floor of the World Trade Center Tuesday morning. Ronnie Clifford managed to escape before it collapsed. But his sister and four-year-old niece were on the second hijacked jet to hit the towers, and of course everyone on that plane was killed. Oh, that's hard, that just, hard to fathom. Mm, yeah. we, so many times we've seen people in the newsroom as different stories have come up and you just say, you almost have to walk away. It's just, it's hard to hear. Now, right now, we're going to play for you an answering machine message heard by a man in San Francisco. Sean Hughes's wife, Melissa, called from the World Trade Center moments after the attack. She was trapped on the 101st floor. Sean Hughes talked about the call on Good Morning America. Okay. Uh, we did play uh, the recording of that call um, and, and if people didn't hear it, we'll play it one more time, because it's hard to remember. That is. Sean, it's me. I just want to let you know I love you, and I'm stuck in this building in New York. A plane hit the building where a bomb went off. We don't know, but there's lots of smoke, and we just wanted you to know that I love you, boys. People were lined up, I understand, for the phone, and so she had to turn it over to someone else. But And, and, and some people may say, why is he in California? Well. There's a practical reason that you're not here, just like uh, Kelly's here at the moment, isn't there? Yes, we've, we've made every effort to schedule flights. Unfortunately, they've all been canceled. Uh, we're looking any means necessary to get to the East Coast. We're even thinking of putting together a somewhat Pony Express of cars to go across the country. We've talked about private charters for airplanes. Uh, we've also talked to, uh, to, with Amtrak who at this point uh, has uh, offered a free ticket for um, myself. So hard to hear. One of the things we want to pass along just coming across the Associated Press wire is little bits of information come in, some, some encouraging and some discouraging. We now know of another victim of these terrorist attacks with a connection to Pennsylvania. Uh, apparently in the those who died at the Pentagon, there is a Navy lieutenant from Mingoville, that's near State College. The name we have is Jonas Panic, P-A-N-I-K, a 26-year-old a again Navy lieutenant now listed among those uh, missing and presumed dead at the Pentagon. And we have a, a firmer number that number at the Pentagon has fluctuated, as you know, throughout the week. And now what they're saying at the Pentagon tonight is that 126 are missing and feared dead in the plane that went down there. Again, one of them from Mingoville State College at Jonas Panic. If you listen to talk radio this week, you may hear people expressing all kinds of, uh, of anger, hatred uh, of Muslims, other racial groups. Uh, is that causing a backlash against Muslim people here in the Pittsburgh area? 
Our John Greiner spoke with Muslim leaders and he joins us from the newsroom. What are they saying, John? Well, Scott, unlike after the Oklahoma City bombing, there has been no violence reported against Muslims in the Pittsburgh area. Some have been harassed, though, so Muslim leaders in the area are asking for understanding. Following the terrorist acts in the U.S., some people in Muslim countries around the world reacted with unabashed joy, angering Americans. But local Muslim leaders say there's no joy in their hearts. Because a lot of people just assume that um, if there's Muslim behind us, that, you know, we're parading and whatnot and stuff. No, we're Americans, you see. As Americans, anything that happens to this country happens to all of us. So we recognize the danger. Um, we have um, um, deep sympathy for those who have passed and died in the, this tragedy. Though no acts of violence are reported against Muslims in the Pittsburgh area, some Muslim women dressed in traditional clothing say they have been harassed and Muslims in Philadelphia report being pelted with rocks. Regardless of what the reaction has been elsewhere, leaders here say calls to the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh have been overwhelmingly positive. People we spoke with say they're supportive too. Well, it's not all Muslims that have caused all the trouble. It's just a few crazy people. So I don't think we should hold that against all Muslims. I don't feel that we can condemn every and all of anything because it's part of the human element that we all have human frailties. You have to look at the good and the bad. Now, the Muslim community has mobilized. Muslim mosques in the Pittsburgh area have set up a monetary fund for the victims of the terrorist acts, and they are conducting their own blood drives. They also say the focus of their prayers tomorrow will be the events of this week. One Muslim leader said they would be condemning all acts of violence against innocent people, and they would be asking God to show us peace, mercy, and the wisdom to distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. I'm John Griner in the newsroom. Scott, back to you. Understandable. All right, thank you, John. A lot of folks have been calling us here at the station wanting to know where they can voice their opinion on the attack. One place, a healthy place to do it, could be the Pittsburgh Channel. We've had some uh, surveys up and running, and people are responding. For example, take a look here. First question, did you believe a terrorist attack of this magnitude would be possible in the U.S.? 56 saying yes, 44% saying no. Another survey question, do you think the U.S. would be justified in attacking the countries that harbor those responsible for the New York and Washington attacks? And not surprisingly, 93% saying yes, 7% saying no. We were going to continue to monitor the surveys online and have your feedback on the Pittsburgh Channel. More people are expressing their thoughts and feelings on that website. And in addition to the surveys, we have some of the quotes that you've left there. And let's take a look at a few of those now. The first one here saying, it is appropriate and required that the U.S. military and police forces take action to protect and defend the American people by eliminating this threat. If vengeance becomes the object of the anger that motivates us, our attackers will be victorious. Another saying, as we told Japan after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, you have awakened a sleeping giant. Our nation has been awakened and we will be responding. Another saying, a great deal of thanks and gratitude goes out to all of our heroes who are assisting in any way possible without a moment's concern for their own safety. So do check in with the Pittsburgh Channel for the very latest, including some elements of the stories that we haven't been able to bring you on television for the sake of time. There's a complete list of the ways you can help. Give blood, give money, phone numbers, prayer services, and also you can participate in those opinions, discussions. And we do have the updated list of victims from the crash scene in Somerset and Washington and New York. We want to remind you that Action News is taking action so you can help. We are still collecting money for the relief effort, well over $100,000. So let's check in again with Stephen Cropper in Studio A. Stephen. Well, Sally and Scott, as you've been mentioning through the afternoon and through, uh, in fact, the past couple of days, people sitting at home may want to reach out and help. They're just not sure how. And this is the opportunity we have teamed up with the Salvation Army, Action News has, to take action and provide a conduit for you at home to help those that are in uh, dire need of help and assistance. The rescue workers in New York, the rescue workers in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon, and also even as close as uh, Shanksville, just up the road from us here. Salvation Army has been uh, working uh, timelessly, or uh, working throughout the evening, I should say, and through the uh, day yesterday to uh, take your donations. The number at the bottom of your screen, 412-243-6000 is the number. Uh, feel free to call in also if you're looking for information, information on how you can volunteer your time as well as your money. As you mentioned, the outpouring here has been totally overwhelming. That is the only word that could describe this. 
So right now, to date, we are uh, at over $166,000 raised. All of the funds, again, tax deductible. They will be going to the relief centers. There are more than a dozen mobile canteens set up in Washington, in, uh, in New York, and also, as I mentioned, in Shanksville. And the rescue workers will, in turn, be relieved through your efforts. So if you are at home looking for something to do, if you are to the point where the numbness is worn off, and you're feeling a bit raw and looking for that something to do, this is it. Give a call, 412-243-6000. We will be here through the evening, and we'll keep you up to date on that. And again, even after the newscast is over, uh, we will still be here taking your phone calls. Scott, Sally. All right, All right. thanks Thank very you, much, Stephen. And uh, we're going to... High-ranking people in uniform uh, were saying the other day, after what happened on Tuesday, missile defense is probably going to be a casualty of all of this because it is so expensive and so many other things are going to immediately be necessary. And in part, John, in this respect, and John, in this respect in part, we talked yesterday about whether the priorities might change because there's been a lot of talk about missile defense and the attack on the United States on Tuesday was utterly conventional. Utterly conventional. And uh, so would a biological weapons attack be utterly conventional, a chemical weapons attack. These are some of the other nightmare scenarios that uh, almost every person that deals with the issue of terrorism and counterterrorism believes are a very real possibility for the United States. You know, Peter, flying airplanes into buildings is something that they have wargamed a number of times. Uh, and it's just one of these things that. They don't want to address it uh, because of all of the restraints on civil liberties and the way that we have been doing business in a free country uh, that would have been impinged. Uh, oh. As you and I have talked about many times, yeah. airplanes fly right over the top of the Pentagon. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. Okay, John, there's a lot to talk about. Please don't go away because I want to come back. Among other things, we learned today, John's talking about the people being put on alert and the necessity they believe in the Pentagon establishment to call up the reserves. But we also learned from Lisa Stark early today, over the 15 or 20 metropolitan areas of New York, there are, are already combat fighter planes flying missions uh, in the sky to protect those American cities. So, so much has been changed in the last couple of days, which all means money and changing priorities, and perhaps ultimately changing profiles for the American military establishment. Let's go to ground zero again here in New York City. ABC's Diane Sawyer has spent much of the day on the road, on the street, and here is a report that she put together. It was a triumph of dogged forward motion, digging against the odds, hope without encouragement. Suddenly, a rescue. Two people pulled from a kind of cave inside a labyrinth of twisted metal, mud, and smoldering ash. I had reached down and I felt a guy's hand, and I ran away, I got scared. And then that's all I know is they said they found somebody. And he touched me first. That's it. We were moving the debris. We had a large uh, steel wall behind the beam. When they removed that, two firefighters just came crawling out. It was unbelievable. You can't believe it. The whole place went crazy. Everybody screaming, chanting, just happy, happy you could do something good. I think they'll be OK. They walked out, and uh, it's amazing. Some good will get out of this. It's a much better day than it was yesterday, because yesterday, all I seen was body bags. They were all firefighters, not the first wave that went in, but the second or third wave who went in searching for those who were missing. It's uncertain how long they were there and how they got through. No time for history when you have a moment of joy in a sea of sadness. All those signatures on my bandana are for guys that I, I fought with within the last three days. And uh, two of them are dead. You're still there? You look. I, I, I love you, Ma. With all the sophistication that built the mighty towers, it's an old-fashioned bucket brigade that will pick up the pieces. The workers are unbearably hot, sweating, some reportedly taking IVs just to rehydrate so they can return to the parched canyon. But it's going to collapse. Nothing information. And it's always dangerous. They are tired of reporters, tired of death, and just unutterably tired. Time to remember that sometimes one victory is reason to go on. Two walked away, that means there's going to be more survivors. There's finally a good feeling coming out of this. They were all firemen, sir? I lost my dad to this, you know? So it kind of feels like I, I gave a little something back today. 
And that's it. I love I love everybody. All right, Glenn, thank you. I love you, Ma. Thank you. We've seen that scene several times today, very moving. Uh, one of the many firefighters working at Ground Zero tonight, and there are a lot of them, and as you know, and I apologize if Diane Sir already mentioned this, um, but we now know, of course, that 300 members of the New York Fire Department uh, have suffered the most grievous loss, and in the station houses around this city tonight, there are not only those names going up on the wall because they'll forever be remembered, but there is a tremendous response on the street to people here, uh, by people here, to the fire departments. Fire departments, people walk by every day, people going in today, taking flowers, taking lunch, talking to people. Uh, and so there is no doubt that all of the rescue workers here have at, at the very least been deeply appreciated to the public and often in a very personal way. John Miller, um, reset the scene for us in terms of, of the investigation. Um, the first thing we know, and it, it, it does come, I think, as a surprise to people that all 18 men who were involved in the hijacking and the attack on the United States have been identified. And I gather at this point, many of their pictures have been produced by authorities. Uh, the Justice Department certainly uh, tells us they have all those pictures. Uh, they had intended to release them to us uh, this evening. And now um, there is some second guessing on that, so we're not sure uh, okay. that that's going to happen. <clears throat> that's also bringing us up to date. Uh, but they've identified 18 hijackers. Uh, they believe they know which ones were on which planes, uh, in some cases in which seats, um, how many on which flights, uh, four on this one, four on that, five and five. Uh, but then tonight there were late developments. Uh, once again, after being briefly reopened to air traffic, the New York area airports were closed. Uh, this because of growing concerns that possibly this wasn't over. Uh, those concerns stem from uh, two men who were taken into custody at Kennedy Airport, uh, detained, still being questioned, uh, identified by sources as Saudis who presented plane tickets issued uh, for Tuesday, the day that all of this havoc began, uh, trying to use those tickets tonight on a cross-country journey. They uh, were questioned by investigators and presented uh, uh, themselves as airplane pilots. They presented uh, certificates uh, saying such. So they're being checked out to determine if, in fact, their names are on these watch lists uh, that authorities have collected and expanded on. Is there some possibility there that they may be genuine Saudi pilots trying to go and meet flights in other parts of the countries to fly elsewhere? Uh, that wasn't the impression authorities had, okay. but uh, I think we've learned in this story that uh, many things that we're told uh, that are certain to be fact uh, later shift as things develop. So uh, I'm going to stop short at saying they're still under scrutiny and in the hands of law enforcement and not yet released. Many thanks. Earlier today at LaGuardia, three men uh, stopped and detained. Uh, they were in a cafeteria, picked up by police, walked out in handcuffs because they had luggage that said they were part of an airline crew. Uh, authorities say they, in fact, are not. So they're trying to figure out who are these guys, where are they going, are they up to something? Um, in terms of leads, I think I asked Brian Ross this earlier and asked you the same question. The FBI says they have had thousands of leads, thousands of tips uh, that they've had to follow. They picked up on their website, they picked up on their hotline. Do you get any sense that the investigators generally are being obliged to spin their wheels on false leads or, and to what degree might it be slowing down the investigation? Well, it certainly does slow down the investigation, yet they've overcompensated and they've done so on purpose. The reason there are 4,000 FBI agents on this, backed up by 3,000 support personnel, is they're anticipating running down so many blind leads, so many dead ends, so many useless tips that go nowhere, but, but they've geared up for that because they know they have to go through all of them to find the one nugget that's going to put them onto something. Thinking uh, back to Oklahoma City, thinking back to Oklahoma City only in terms of magnitude, is this the largest number of agents have ever been put on an investigation? This is the largest number of agents that have ever been assigned to a single case. Uh, this is certainly the largest crime uh, in U.S. Right. history and the largest investigation ever approached by the FBI to the extent that they've brought in other agencies and other agents to run leads from ATF, from U.S. Customs. And uh, has it strained the resources of the FBI, do you believe? So far, uh, while there's some discomfort here in New York, they're operating out of a garage at right. a location we've been asked not to disclose. They're not in their regular place because they feel under threat there. Um, uh, they've been able to accomplish most of what they've set out to. I've, I've called into the command post a number of times today, and what I have not heard is 
uh, we're frustrated because we're not getting this or we're not getting that. Uh, they've had anything they've asked for. Well, okay. Thanks very much, John. Uh, don't go far. With 4,000 agents in the FBI assigned to that, that's 50% of all the agents in the country. So that gives you another sense of the magnitude um, of this investigation from the FBI's point of view. It is a national investigation, and of course, it is a global investigation. And here's ABC's Brian Ross. Brian. Peter, there are some credible leads have given uh, investigators hope they are finally cracking what they consider to be a worldwide network. And as they pursue the leads, they say they are getting closer and closer to what they believe is a terror network of Osama bin Laden. In Germany, police in Hamburg raided 10 different locations and made two arrests today looking for accomplices. Another man was taken into custody for questioning in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And new evidence emerged that prior to Tuesday's attack, some of the hijackers had holed up in this house in the Washington suburb of Vienna, Virginia. The hijackers of the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania had launched their mission from the Marriott Hotel at the Newark airport. And the terrorists that hijacked the two Boston flights seem to have begun their long trek from small towns in Florida. The total number of hijackers to our best uh, estimate and our best knowledge given the information at this time on the four planes that crashed was at least 18. And it's becoming clear that of the 18 terrorists, this man, Mohammed Atta, played a pivotal role in the attacks. Prior to coming to the United States, Atta and his cousin, Marwan al-Shihi, lived in Hamburg in Germany, a country federal authorities say has been used often as a base by a number of bin Laden operatives. A neighbor said the two men had lived here on and off for the last two years and had frequent Arab guests. Fifteen months ago, the two men showed up at a small airfield in Venice, Florida to earn their private pilot's licenses. Then at the end of last year in December, Atta and Al-Shihi went for jet training at a cost of some $39,000, taking flight simulator lessons for large commercial jets at a private flight school in Opelika, Florida, where Henry George conducted the training. They called and, and uh, inquired about the type of training we did and made a reservation or schedule training. It, uh, they gave me their credit card number and we uh, scheduled the training. Atta was on board the first plane to hit the World Trade Center. American Airlines Flight 11. His cousin, Al Shihi, was on board the second plane, United 175, which hit the other tower 18 minutes later. Their capacity to uh, operate the aircraft was su sub substantial. Uh, it's very clear that these orchestrated, coordinated assaults on our country were well conducted and uh, conducted in a technically proficient way. It is not, not easy to land uh, these kinds of aircraft at very specific locations with accuracy or to direct them with uh, the kind of accuracy which was deadly in this case. We're now joined in our Washington bureau by Eric Holder, the former deputy attorney general of the United States in the Clinton administration, at one point the acting attorney general. It was on, on his watch that the U.S. had to deal, as did, as did he, with the USS Cole attack and the embassy bombings in Africa. Mr. Holder, thanks very much for your time. I, I want to just ask you first whether there is anything you see that suggests that in any way this attack on the United States could have been prevented. Well, it's hard to say that. Um, you know, we get intelligence, uh, things that you look at all the time, and certainly we saw things in the past about the possible hijacking of planes. I uh, never saw anything to suggest that planes would be used in the way that they were here. Um, one of the things that I think you mentioned earlier, this is obviously going to spawn, I think, a investigations and it should to find out why we didn't know more about uh, what ha what actually happened and I suspect in the course of those investigations we'll get the answer to the question you've just posed. But John McCarthy of the Pentagon said a while ago that the military had among other things gamed a situation like this. Do you believe the Clinton administration of which you were part could have done more for homeland security as it's called? Well, I think we did a good job. We tried to anticipate uh, those things that were most likely to happen, tried to plan for those things, even those things that were not likely to occur. Um, we took appropriate steps after um, bin Laden struck. We were successful in preventing uh, the attacks related to the millennium change. 
um, you know, we did the best that, that we could, and I'm not at all certain that there were any specific things we might have been able to do um, that would have prevented this. I mean, obviously, you have to look at the, the question of intelligence. Um, is there a way in which you could have found out about the planning for this? I suspect this is something that lasted over the course of many, many months, and uh, it is there that I would focus my attention. You're pretty experienced at government officials under pressure. As you look at the public officials today, the president and the attorney general and the other members of the national bureaucracy, do you see any strain? No, I think they're actually handling themselves pretty well. Um, I, I think obviously you saw some emotion come out of the president today, and I think that's very understandable. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of room, a lot of meetings in the Situation Room. Uh, people at the Justice Department are having to render legal opinions about the kinds of steps that are being considered by the president, by people in the military. I'm sure there are a lot of late nights that uh, people are putting in. But I think overall, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft, President Bush have been handling themselves quite well. Much of the evidence now being obtained in this investigation is being obtained under something called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is pretty much equivalent, I think some people believe, to martial law. Um, as a result, do you believe that civil liberties have effectively been suspended in the country? No, I don't think so. Uh, the FISA Act, uh, about which you speak, is something that is pretty routinely used. Um, uh, it involves the monitoring of um, conversations using means that I can't really get into. Uh, to, to protect our, our country. These are things that are done on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, totally consistent with the law. In order to um, use the FISA Act, you have to go to a special court here in Washington, D.C., and a federal judge has to sign off on something that is prepared uh, after careful review within the Department of Justice. So uh, the, the use of FISA and FISA warrants is not something that is uh, inconsistent with what we have done uh, over a great many years. Okay, FISA, of course, being the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, okay. Just one, uh, one final question. You, you were there for the coal. Um, you were there for the bombings of, in Tanzania and in Kenya. You were there for, forgive me for saying so, the fruitless attacks in pursuit of Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden. How complicated is this going to be, and how much do you think Americans will have to go through before there is anything approaching resolution, or do we have the vaguest idea? I'm not at all certain that we can say how long this is going to take. Uh, I remember President Kennedy, I believe it was, talked about a, a long twilight struggle. Uh, I think that's what we have to be prepared for in America. This is not something that is going to be done quickly. It is not something that is going to be done uh, in a very surgical way. It's going to take a number of efforts, a number of battles are going to be fought. There are probably going to be some losses. Uh, there is going to be life lost on our side, I suspect, as we uh, try to bring uh, people to justice and beyond that, uh, try to incapacitate the people who perpetrated these crimes. Mm. I, I think we make a mistake if we think this is simply a criminal justice problem. This is much, much bigger than that. What we faced in the Clinton administration, I think, was adequately handled by the criminal justice mm. system. This is well beyond anything um, that the criminal justice system can handle. Just one final question or one more question. Um, as, as you listen to some of the politicians talking today, and I grant you some people in the media as well, do you think there's a danger that the expectations of the American people will be raised about a more immediate or a short-term solution and that that in itself is dangerous? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that people have to understand uh, we have to respect our enemy here. They are people who are obviously dedicated, fanatical, I would say. They are extremely capable. They are evil in a way that we rarely see uh, in the history of this world. Um, and I think we have to be prepared to engage them over the course of many months, many years, um, in a whole different variety of forums. And I don't think that we can expect two months from now, six months from now, this thing to be over, no matter what the military a actions that are taken uh, in the short term. It's going to take much beyond that to finally roll these people up and uh, incapacitate them. So the United States is in for a long haul? I really believe that's true. I, you know, I'd like to be able to tell you something other than that, but I, I don't believe that that's the case, and I think the American people need to steal themselves for it. I think the American people, uh, American people are capable of doing this. I think it's incumbent upon our leaders to uh, get the nation ready for what has been described, I think, very accurately uh, as a war. Eric Holder, thank you very much for your time. Eric Holder in our Washington Bureau Night, the former Deputy Attorney General of the United States and at one point the Acting Attorney General of the United States in the Clinton administration, um, telling us what all of the people most familiar with this have told us today. This is going to be a long struggle. Now, as we have watched uh, the results, uh, which have been have just been like a ripple effect across the country and across the world of what happened at the Twin Trade Towers. And we have focused from time to time on companies uh, which had their offices in the Trade Towers. And there is no company, to the best of our knowledge, which has been more profoundly affected than a company called Cantor Fitzgerald, 
which does a huge amount of the bond trading in the United States. A huge number of its employees have been lost and are still, have been lost and or are still missing. And earlier today, ABC's Connie Chung sat down and talked to the CEO of that company. And we wanted very much for her to come back live this evening and, and review her, her, her reporting on that company today. Connie? Thank you, Peter. Peter, just some on Wall Street, Cantor Fitzgerald sort of symbolizes the devastation of the terrorist attack when American Airlines flight number 11 uh, crashed into the North Tower. It cut off any hope of escape for almost all of the Cantor employees. The global leader in real In the high-flying world of high finance, the, the company of Cantor Fitzgerald occupies an elite position. Last year, the firm handled $50 trillion of business CD, as an exchange rocket, market for banks and companies and doing trades in the global bond the market. And for its headquarters, Cantor chose an elite location, proudly showcased in its corporate video, the North Tower of the World Trade Center. About 1,000 of Cantor's employees worked on the 101st, 103rd, 104th, and 105th floors of the tower. Doug Gardner was the chief financial officer of Cantor, his wife, Jennifer. Doug is everyone's shoulders. If you, if you need support, his shoulders. If you need money or, or a helping hand, there was his hands. If you needed legs for a basketball game, he was there. He just was everybody's rock, everybody's center, the warmest, kindest, biggest smile, big blue eyes, the most delicious man you ever met. As CFO, Gardner had a window office on the executive wing of the 105th floor. Gardner liked to get in early. He was at his desk at 8.48 a.m. on Tuesday. Jennifer Gardner didn't find out right away that a plane had crashed into the North Tower, hitting between floors 96 and 103. She was with her children, Michael and Julia. Did your husband talk to anyone that morning when the plane hit? Yes. Doug's father, Joe Gardner, called Doug at 10 of 9 when we heard, he heard on the news that there was an explosion, and Doug answered the phone and said, we're evacuating, we have to get out of here. And Doug's father just said, go, go. So, you know, I heard someone called me and told me that someone talked to Doug, and I was like, fine. So I went home kind of casually to watch what happened. And then I saw the building collapse, and I felt his presence just leave me. Cantor Fitzgerald has set up a corporate center at the Pierre Hotel, providing up-to-date information and grief counseling. Two employees who were on the concourse level survived, badly burned in critical condition. None of the hundreds of employees on the upper floors is believed to have made it out. Have you told your children? Julia doesn't really understand anything. She feels the intense emotion around her, but she's still too much of a baby. Michael is five. He knows. We told him that um, there was a big accident at Daddy's building, and we can't find him. And then the next day, he woke up and he said, I think Daddy died. I want them to know that Daddy did not leave because he wanted to, but that he was taken. And then it wasn't his fault, and it wasn't their fault, and that Daddy loved them. Howard Lutnick, the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald, was best friends with Doug Gardner. Lutnick had been on top of the world, celebrating his 40th birthday this past July in Europe with Doug and Jennifer Gardner and other friends in the company. Last Tuesday, his world and his company crumbled around him. Of the 1,000 Cantor employees at the uh, Trade Center, only 300 are accounted for at this time, and none was at the building at that time. This immense human loss has truly devastated the chairman and CEO, Howard Lutnick, whose own brother is missing and presumed dead. You have suffered such great professional and personal loss. I mean, do you, what is the fate of your brother? Well, my brother, my brother was on the 103rd floor. He worked, he worked for me, and um, he worked at Cantor. And uh, he, he called my sister uh, just after the, just after the plane hit, and he told her that um, he said that the smoke was pouring in. He was, he was stuck in a corner office. There was no way out. 
and the smokers community is he's not good and, and things are not good and he's not gonna make it. And he just wanted to say that he loved her. And he wanted to say goodbye and uh, tell everyone that that he loved them. And then the phone went the phone went dead. So so while I'm the head of the company I'm trying to help my seven hundred employees who are missing their their loved ones, I'm just just another one of them. Just another one of them. Normally, you would have been in your office uh, on which floor? 105th floor. On the 105th floor. And yet, you didn't go in early that morning because of a critical decision you made. <laughs> my, uh, my little boy, I have a five-year-old, and it was his first day of kindergarten at, uh, at Horace Mann. So I took him for his first day at big boy school. And uh, because of that, I was late getting down to the office and uh, therefore I, I wasn't in the building I was on my way to the building instead. and when you got to the building well I, I, I saw the building on fire so I, I didn't go in um, but I stood I stood at the door um, off of Church Street um, where there were flags there and I stood at that door um, and people were coming out and I was yelling at them you know to run and get out and uh, there were police sort of around me um, yelling at people, telling them to get out. And, and I would ask them what floor they were coming from, what floor are they coming from. And someone would say 55, and I'd scream, we have 55, and because and, I kept wanting to get up the building and, and get people out of the building. Because all your employees were on? 101 to 105. The top floors of, the, of number one World Trade Center, the, which they call now the North Tower. So how high was the highest number that you got to? I got to the 91st floor, and I knew if I got one employee what, if one person came down from that floor, then I know that there had to be others. There would be others behind them. There would be others going out other doors that, that would be good. But I got up to 91, and then I heard this sound. It sounded like another plane was going to hit the building. And was it, but it didn't sound like it was far away. It sounded like it was like right where the ceiling is above us. It was so unbelievably loud. And someone screamed out, another one's coming. So I just turned around and ran, and I, and I was running. I, what was it? It was, it was number two World Trade Center collapsing. So I'm, a, I'm standing underneath a building like an idiot. Um, and I start running, and I'm trying to get ahead of the smoke, and then the smoke comes around the corner on Trinity Church where I ran and knocks me down underneath a truck, and I'm sitting there in this black, the blackest black that can ever be. I reached up, I tried to see if I could see, and I took my hands and I put it up, and I actually touched my eye, because and it was so much smoke, and I wasn't so You couldn't enough. even see your own hand? I, I couldn't see my hand. I could feel the particles in the air. They were, they were like this big. I could feel them going in, and I wasn't, I couldn't think to, like, pick up my shirt and put I was just, I was just sitting there thinking, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe by standing there I died. So I just start walking, I just start walking straight. And I just walk straight. And I just keep walking straight. And I called my wife four hours later. And she was hysterical crying. And so I understand why it took lots of people a long time. I, I was, I'm a pretty together person, and I, four hours I walked. I just walked north. I just kept walking. One of your other offices had a squawk box open, and, and the other offices were able to hear the screams. Is that true? I don't, I don't know that they heard. It is, it is true that we have a squawk line. box. Yeah, we have you know, a speakerphone because all our offices are connected in our equity business. They're, um, they're all connected to each other because they talk to each other all day. And they heard them saying, you know, we need help, we need help, we need help. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't screams. It was there was nowhere to go. You couldn't go down. Couldn't go up. There was nowhere to go. But I don't know of a single one of my employees who got down. Zero. Zero, and it's really sad. But I think we're all pulling together with a view that we want to make things happen for them. We, we need to take care of them. We need to figure out how to take care of them and give them more to take care of them. And I think it's going to be a different kind of drive than I've ever had before. It's not about my, it's not about my family. I get to kiss my kids. I get to kiss my kids tonight but other people don't get to kiss their kids. And I just have to help them. And I think, I think what's amazing, and I think it's amazing, you have 300 people. They lost all their friends. They lost a person to their left. They lost a person to their right. And they call me up and they say, I want to go to work. I say, why do you want to go to work? Let's just go to funerals. And they go, no, no, I want to go to work. I can't stay home. I can't stay home. I have to make, I have to work. I have to do something. And so they, they actually wanted to try to figure out how to be in business. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. But the, the, the reason they want to be in business, and there's only one reason to be in business, is because we have to make our company be able to take care of my 700 families.
700 families. How to have 700 families? <laughs> Just, I can't say it. I can't say it without crying. You spent hours and hours talking to every family member. You have spent hours at the Pierre Hotel in that ballroom. Well, I, I go in, I, I just, I, I just tell them, look, I'll, I'll answer any question, any question you want, anything about it. But I lost my brother, and I'm in no different position than you are. I'm not any different. I'll just tell you everything I know. But I get to say to everybody so that they believe me that when I say that we are doing everything we can to find their kid, that they know that I do not look for my brother. I don't go to any hospital or get anybody to go to any hospital and say, find Gary Lutnick for me. Why I not? Because I go with an employee list. I say, here's my list. Here's everybody I got. Find somebody on this list. I don't care who they are. Because if you find someone on this list, then I get to call them. And I get to give somebody else some hope, some dream. Maybe, maybe they get to kiss their kids. It, it, it's, I'd, I'd love to find my brother, but I'd love to find I'd love to find their brother, or their wife, or their husband, or their, anything, anything. It's so, been said that the loss of your company will have worldwide impact. Cannon Fitzgerald is the primary, it's like the exchange for the world's bond markets. I mean, it's, it, it is the exchange for the world bond markets. Uh, we last, last year we did $50 trillion in business. Today, the remaining employees of Cannon Fitzgerald and Eastbeat have worked every second since that bomb. And they made the decision. And I told them there's no reason for us to open. I don't care when we open, if we open, it doesn't matter to me. And they collectively, 250 of them, collectively voted that they were going to open the markets. And this morning at 7 a.m., those people opened for business, not to, to make money, not to, but they did it because they thought if the if the Fed and the Treasury wanted it to be open, and it was important enough for them to show strength for America and for these markets, then they were going to do their damnedest to get it open, and they did. And it, I, I voted against it. I said, why? I, I don't want you to work. I want you to go home and kiss your kids and, and hug your families. And, but they, it's them. They wanted, they wanted to do it, maybe for themselves, maybe for the, their friends who they lost. But so right this second, it, our electronic systems are running around the world, and it's... I don't know. Maybe it's a miracle. Maybe it's because these people are just, they're unbelievable. They're well, the best. Maybe they're the best because they had an incredible boss. I think it goes the other way around. I think you can only be a good boss if you have the right people. And I'm glad they chose to be with me, but I'm the saddest person in the world that they chose to be with me. Because <laughs> they would have chose to be with me. <laughs> so many people. So many names, so many people I loved. Many of the Cantor families that we spoke with said that he's truly a remarkable man. And um, I, I think, Peter, he just clearly doesn't fit the image of a typical CEO on Wall Street. No kidding. Thanks, Connie, very much, Connie Chung. Howard Lutnick, a personality from Cantor Fitzgerald, the CEO, a man with 700 families, and a much... Uh, expanded family, I would think, now that we have seen him and, and shared his tragedy with him. Howard Lutnick, a personality this country will not forget, period. Now, as we take a deep breath, there are major developments in the investigation. The attempt to get at the United States continues. John Miller. Peter, we've spoken to people who are updating us on the people who have been taken into custody today. ABC News learned that the number, they are up to 10 people in custody, nine men, one woman, uh, two groups, one uh, taken into custody at Kennedy Airport. Uh, that was about 4 to 4.15 this afternoon, uh, four men with open tickets to various destinations. Sources tell us they were carrying false identification, knives, uh, pilot certificates, and documentation from the Flight Safety International School in Vero Beach, Florida, where we know and have already reported three of the suspects from Tuesday's horror attended and learned to fly before uh, the hijackings. Uh, the other incident this afternoon, uh, or this evening, at uh, LaGuardia Airport at around 7.30 p.m., five men 
also traveling with open tickets to various destinations, false identification, and knives. So authorities are pretty raised up about this on the theory that this was possibly a second attempt at a round of hijackings to different de destinations by people who were carrying documentation showing that they were qualified or prepared to fly commercial jetliners. Let's, let's just simply do it again, John, so we get it completely stuck in our mind. Ten individuals at Kennedy Airport, nine men, one woman. Uh, ten individuals total, nine men, one woman. Um, at Kennedy Airport, uh, it was four men uh, and one woman. At LaGuardia this evening, around 7.30, that was the last incident, five men. And do we know where they are now? Uh, they are in police and federal custody. Uh, Commonly, they're taken uh, to the police building at LaGuardia and at Kennedy Airport. The FBI has its own field office. Um, I don't know that they're there, but that's where the, that's the most likely place they would have been taken by procedure. Do we know where the individuals came from? Uh, we do not. We know that they are uh, foreign nationals, but I don't have the nations. I heard you mention earlier when we were talking briefly about these arrests that you thought at least, or somebody thought at least, one of them or more of them was from Saudi Arabia. Uh, when, we, uh, when we first talked about uh, the two that were uh, picked up at Kennedy, the first two this afternoon, both of those men were identified to us as Saudis. Okay, but you told us everything you know so far. Yeah. And having told us, the word is going to go out um, across the network to all of our correspondents as well as to all of you to pursue this story um, in as vigorous a way as possible. Um, at Kennedy and at LaGuardia, people picked up on the basis of the evidence we have well, you've heard it. I don't need to repeat it nor to speculate upon it. Let's move on to Washington, to Claire Shipman outside the White House tonight. Claire, talk to us about Vice President Cheney and President Bush. Um, on this, the third day, they have been separated. Well, they have, Peter, and it's interesting because on Tuesday, we discussed the fact that as President Bush was making his way back to the White House, they already had plans in place to at least temporarily ask the Vice President to move to Camp David. And as it turns out, they have, he has been spending the nights there, and they've now asked him to move back there again. It's, um, it's a sign of how worried the Secret Service is about possible threats because they don't do that idly. In fact, we were told on Tuesday, look, we think it might just be for the night and then he'd be able to be back working at the White House. Um, in, a, in a sense, the entire city has, has the jitters a little bit, especially since the Secret Service, in addition, increased the perimeter of um, security around the White House once again. But we're told that the Vice President is either working from Camp David or perhaps even a, a secure military site close to Camp David. And what's also interesting about What's happening with the vice president right now is we haven't seen him at all. He played a major role on Tuesday, as we know from a lot of reporting that's emerged, um, immediately being taken to an underground secure site in the White House and communicating constantly with the president. And we're told from people behind the scenes who know what's going on, who sit in on meetings, that, that the vice president is ob obviously playing the very role, really, that the president intended him to play when he picked him as, as vice president. He's got a lot of expertise in, in foreign policy, and um, there's no doubt he's heavily involved. But this physical separation has made um, uh, quite a few people who simply work in the White House well aware that it is not business as usual. At the same time, of course, the president's been trying to portray business as usual on his schedule. As you know, he made the visit to the, the hospital today. He intends to head up to New York tomorrow. So it's a it's a very delicate balance, Peter. Okay, can I just um, ask you to put the information we've just had from John Miller into your system as well and see what we get back from the White House. Um, the White House has not actually uh, been very forthcoming on why the two of them are separated other than to say that it makes sense, correct? No, they have not at all. In fact, there's been a little bit of a back and forth over whether the vice president was actually asked to go to Camp David by the Secret Service or chose to go. My sense is from talking to security sources is that this is of a piece with the increased perimeter around the White House. This is something that the security team felt was prudent at this point, but they will not tell us why. And, and confirm for me, but I think we both already know one can communicate with Camp David uh, just like you can communicate from the White House or, or Air Force One, but it just simply means that they're not able to be in the same room and consult on the basis on which they normally, or at least often, do. 
Absolutely. Completely secure, secure communications there, um, a setup that the, the president recently got. In fact, he told us at his ranch in Texas. But again, there is a chance, we're, we're told, that the vice president may be working from someplace just close to Camp David, an even more secure military facility. Okay. Thanks very much, Claire Shipman. We'll come back to you in the course of the evening. Let's now go to Cynthia McFadden, who has held her post at St. Vincent's Hospital here in New York for many, many, many hours to give us some sense of the relief operation as seen from, from the relief workers themselves and also from the medical teams there, Cynthia. Well, Peter, to add to the bad news of the evening, um, in the last two and a half, three hours, there have been 27 rescue workers brought in here for treatment. One of them in an extremely bad condition. One of them fell six stories. Uh, six stories in rubble downtown. Um, they say he has a serious back injury. They won't have the full extent of the injuries uh, evaluated for another hour or so. We'll come back to you with reports on his condition when we have more. The debris at uh, the center of the disaster uh, is reported to be 10 stories high by rescue workers who have just come out and briefed us uh, and is very unstable. In fact, it is so unstable, it is so dark, and it is so... Um, potentially dangerous now that they have moved back the line of the front line of rescue workers uh, we are told by those who have just come out uh, they intend however and this is a quote to dig frantically during the night uh, they are so concerned about potential survivors under the rubble uh, Peter I have with me an emergency room doctor here at St. Vincent's who is prepared to talk to us a bit about those people who may still be alive, buried under the rubble. It has been 45 hours, um, Dr. Curry, since any victim of the collapse has been brought here. Talk to us about people who may, in fact, be alive in air pockets. The things you worry a lot about now are dehydration, um, issues where people have trouble with, with moving because of crush injuries, broken bones, uh, potential loss of limb because of ischemia, no blood supply to the area. And also a tremendous feeling of panic. Um, but with muscle breakdown, there's a chance of kidney failure, which is made worse by dehydration. What you're saying is as time goes on, conditions are only deteriorating. Absolutely. The more time out, the more things you have to worry about. And you're, at, you're already behind the eight ball because you've got dehydration. Now, there have been reports of rain. We've been talking about this on and off all day. It, it complicates things from a medical point of view. Just wait one second while this. There, there we go. Well, the rain's going to make it a little more difficult to get people out of the site, but it's also going to be a factor in affecting their temperature, dropping their, their temperature where a lot of things like hypothermia comes into play, where other organ systems start to not work well. People don't maintain their alert status when their temperature falls. So a lot of things become more difficult. You're still on ready alert here at the emergency room. Yes. And Peter, what you're hearing in the back... Go ahead. This is what been what's been going on all day. These are, of course, it's Seventh Avenue behind us here through Greenwich Village. This is the main supply path through New York City. There, of course, there's the West Side Highway closed down too. But this is the way the construction workers are getting downtown and the rescue workers. And uh, throughout the day, there have been these trucks going down. I should note that several of the rescue workers who have been most recently brought here to St. Vincent's are construction workers, iron workers, and other construction workers uh, who have been who have been going up as high as possible on cranes and trying to, to trying to battle. S Cynthia, uh, before you go on with that. You are very concerned. Just before you go on with yes, that, are you on the route via which much of the rubble is being removed from the Trade Center, or is that simply vehicular traffic going in? It's just going in, Peter. We haven't seen the rubble coming out. In fact, we've been talking about where is it going. Uh, but no, we're we're on the. They, they go downtown uh, empty. The ambulances are dispatched from up above us. The ambulances. We, in fact, at one point a couple of hours ago, there was a whole flotilla of ambulances going downtown. They later ended up back here filled with patients. But no, this is the the supply route. Okay, as you continue and in with it. As you continue with Dr. Curry, would you also ask her, what are the hopeful signs? Because we do know that people survive for lengthy periods of time. Dr. Curry, Peter Jennings points out there, there, there must be some hopeful signs. We do know that people survive for long periods of time. Can you, can you point to those? Yes, there have been situations earlier today that we learned about. A woman who was inside the building who had used the cell phone was recovered, was pregnant, doing very well from what we've heard. Um, so it was really great news that mom and baby are doing well. 
but you have to really kind of look. There are pockets of, of places where people can still survive. I don't know a lot of the details, not getting direct information from the scene, but there's always hope and until the people at the scene really tell us otherwise. How long, if the injuries are not too severe, and if rescue workers can get to someone in a pocket of air, you can survive for quite a long period of time? Yes, you can, because if we had remembered far back in time when they had the other building, uh, you know, burn and bomb, people have survived a week, sometimes a little longer, depending on what their basic health status was like. You know, and, uh, Dr. Curry, I'm unfamiliar, and Peter stopped me if I just missed this in our coverage today, but I don't know about the pregnant woman you're talking about. This is what we have heard through other sources. I can't confirm that, but we had heard that there was a woman who was in the rubble who was pregnant and was talking on the cell phone, was actually re reached and rescued. But we have not been able to get that from another doctor at Bellevue, somebody we got through administration. Well, Dr. Curry, thank you very much. I know you're on duty, and I'll let you go back to your post. So, Peter, that is the uh, news from downtown tonight. Um, I have one more question for it's you. Grim. Sure. I, I have one more question for you because you alerted us today to the fact that many of the relief workers felt they were in very short supply of very crucial things which they needed. How did that get resolved? Well, Peter, at your suggestion, we did call FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management um, Agency. Uh, they said the following. This is, it, let me just get to my page of notes about this, Peter, because it's a little bit complicated, but bear with me. There, there are federal aid workers downtown, rescue workers. There are eight teams of FEMA rescuers downtown. Now, on each team, there are approximately 62 to 72 individuals, which puts the federal workers at about 500. The federal workers are well supplied, FEMA tells us. Uh, they have plenty of everything. It is the state workers, New York State and New Jersey rescue workers, who are without many of the items we talked about, without boots, without gloves, without ponchos, and the other items we talked about. We asked FEMA whether or not they would help resupply the state workers. They said our phone call was the first they had been alerted to the fact they needed supplies, that yes, they would try to step into the breach and help. But that, this is a big bureaucracy, uh, and they were not opposed to having individual citizens uh, participate in the ways uh, in which the state had asked us to uh, alert the public. So may I again say, they are looking for aid. They are looking for ponchos, particularly for tonight's rain. They are looking for boots. They are looking for gloves. They would like them delivered to the, uh, to the Chelsea Piers on 11th Avenue and 23rd Street or to 7th Avenue. Uh, and 14th Street, and they will be brought downtown. Uh, they, are, they are in very short supply. We have reports uh, tonight again of men coming out from the rescue effort uh, covered in white dust with blood, red blood hands from digging without gloves. Cynthia, thanks Back very much. Well, uh, keep us honest on that one uh, because we all know how much people in the country want to help considering calling up the military reserves for the first time since the Gulf War. Former President Bill Clinton was in Australia when all of this happened. His wife, of course, is the junior senator from New York. The president was rushed back to the United States, and today NBC News cameras caught up with him for his reaction. We have to improve our defenses, and we have to let people know that, that uh, there will be a strong sanction for this. I, and I believe America, if we stay together, if the people will stay together and keep their spirits strong, I believe the president will find out what happened. I think it'll be the right thing. This is what Former President Bill Clinton tonight, who has just returned from a speaking tour in Australia. NBC's Robert Bazell is at Manhattan's Bellevue Hospital Center, where there have been people being treated, but so many families showing up, hoping that they'll find their loved ones there. Robert? Yes, Tom, when I came in here just now the, by the wall outside of, with people whose uh, photographs have been missing, some of the doctors and nurses from here at Bellevue, which is one of the most famous hospitals in the world, certainly has the biggest trauma center in New York City, some doctors and nurses were looking at those pictures and, and just weeping because uh, they feel the same thing that everybody here feels about all these people who are missing and the lack of survivors that we have here. With me is Dr. Eric Mannheim, who is the medical director here at Bellevue. Dr. Mannheim, today you had some people from the rescue site come in, correct? Yes, we had uh, about a half a dozen uh, firefighters uh, and sanitation workers uh, come in to, to the emergency. What kind, of, what kind of injuries are you seeing today? The kinds of things we're seeing now are predominantly uh, 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 exposure, um, 
temperature problems, uh, dehydration, and we're still seeing some crush injuries. Now, you had some, a team that went down right after the explosion mm -hmm. and, a, and did an amazing rescue job on a Port Authority police officer. Tell me that story. That's correct. There was this Port Authority uh, uh, police officer who was called uh, immediately after the event, who was at 42nd Street, and raced downtown with a bunch of colleagues. He was caught in the immediate collapse of the first tower. Um, he was uh, found uh, later on that day, very fortunately, however, he was pinned. And it took hours and hours to extricate him. We sent a trauma team down thinking that his legs might have to be amputated. Fortunately, they were able to extricate him. However, he had what's called compartment syndrome. We had such swelling in his lower extremities that there had to be emergency procedures to relieve the pressure. He's currently uh, here in critical condition. His kidneys have failed. However, there's a lot of hope that he'll get kidney function back as a result of that traumatic injury. Now, you have a lot of other stories like that, all, dozens and dozens of them in this hospital, right? Right. There are, there are many, many, many stories. There was a woman, for example, 32 years old, who was on the 13th floor, who was found, and she also had multiple, multiple uh, trauma, particularly facial injuries and lower extremity injuries. She's going to do fine. She's going to walk out of here in, a, in a, probably a week or two. And how does that heartening story compare when you see the, all those pictures on the wall outside of people desperate for their loved ones? I think for all of us here, it's the one thing that, that keeps us going. We're, we're very hopeful that there'll be a f several more uh, people rescued from the site. We're still uh, in the business of taking care of all the workers, anybody that has any kind of injury whatsoever. Um, and I think it's keeping the spirits of the staff up somewhat. Though we're, I think we're quite realistic about the enormous tragedy that's occurred downtown. So, Tom, that's the story here from Bellevue, which has amazing facilities that are standing by to take care of anybody who comes out of the rubble. But unfortunately, that's been very few so far. Tom? That has been the tragic irony of the medical situation here in New York. Almost from the beginning, people standing by, preparing to take care of the people that they thought would overwhelm their facilities. And there have been just too few of them because so many are still trapped in that rubble. New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani says that just over 4,700 people have been reported missing at this point at the site of the World Trade Center. Some 700 of those missing came from just one company housed in the World Trade Center, 700 out of about 1,000 employees at that one office. Dateline's Bob McEwen has more on that story tonight. Here and abroad, they were the ultimate symbols of America and American business, the Twin Towers, home to some of the giants of U.S. finance. You may well not know its name, but one of those companies is called Cantor Fitzgerald. Cantor Fitzgerald dominates the bond market. Last year, the firm did $50 trillion in business. But according to chairman and CEO Howard Luckman, what's made him most proud isn't its bottom line, but the kind of company it is. We are a family. We are the tightest group of people. And we always have been a tight group of people. But you just don't know it. We did know it. But I mean, this last couple of days, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And how long these past few days must have been for Howard Lutnick. In a catastrophe that's crushed an entire country, no one can have been hit harder than he has. We have lost every single person who was in the office. We don't know of any not a single one person getting down from the 101st to the 105th floors where our offices were, not a single person. Incredibly, it was just over 48 hours ago that Cantor Fitzgerald was on top of the financial world and of the World Trade Center. The firm occupied four floors high up in the North Tower from the 101st to the 105th. A thousand employees, traders and executives, secretaries and support staff went to work there every day. But this Tuesday, CEO Howard Lutnick was going to be late. He didn't want to miss his son's first day in kindergarten. I mean, I wasn't there because I dropped my baby off at school for my five-year-old's first day of school, but that means that I get there late. That means I get to be alive. And anybody who got there early doesn't get to. It's, it's unthinkable. Even without him, the day began as it often does, with a conference call between New York and the office in Los Angeles. At about quarter to nine, over the speakerphone, Cantor Fitzgerald employees on the West Coast heard someone in New York say, I think a plane just hit us. I got a call when, as I was leaving the, my son's school that, that there was, you know, a plane hit the Trade Center. So I just, we went right down. We were at the top of the building and I saw 
I saw a lot of smoke, and I knew it was not good. And not good. And all I was saying on the way down is, it's not good. This is not good. The first jetliner had smashed into the North Tower at about the 90th story, not far below where Cantor Fitzgerald's offices began on the 101st. An inferno of jet fuel now rampaged upwards, consuming floor after floor. It's unfathomable that everyone would die. It's not, it's not possible. Someone would get out. So I, I just, all I wanted was to hear one person say they were on 101. Just one person who was on 101. I got to, I, people were coming out of the building and I grab them and they're sort of like out of it. And I take them and say, what, what floor are you on? And I got all the police around that door to shake people and say, what floor are you on? And they'd say 50. And I'd scream out there, I got a 50 and a 60 and a 70. I got up to 91. And someone said they worked on the 91st floor and they came down and they got out. And then the, the building collapsed. And I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody. With people off on vacation or business trips and those who simply got to work late, Lutnick now believes everyone who was in the office that day perished, about 700 in all. There's 700, 700 of my families. I can't say it. 700 of my families. 700. I'm just one, but they're all 700. There's so many of them. They all lost their son or their daughter. People come up to me and say, I only have one daughter. <laughs> what do I do? Hey. This is too many. Too many. Too many. Is there any way to describe what these past few days have been like for you? They're a blur. They're a blur of crying and hugs, of trying to help people and give them information when they when there isn't really any positive news to give, um, to be strong enough to help them. But I'm just another one of them. And um, it's, just, it's just the world moving like the, at a snail's pace. The day just lasts forever, and every minute is extended in the arm. And he says every minute of every day has been spent trying to find someone, anyone, Who's missing? Cantor Fitzgerald has established a crisis center at New York's Hotel Pierre with grief counselors and a list of those employees who went to work on Tuesday but never went home. All of the families, they hunt down every lead, they run every place, they go to every hospital with this big, with this employee list. I make sure that we go with our list of 700 people and say, find someone on this list. Find me someone on this list because someone on this list means that I can call a family and I can tell them that, that they, they have a reason to not be sad anymore. But as of today, they've located only four hospitalized Cantor Fitzgerald employees, each of whom was just arriving at the World Trade Center when the attack took place. And as if all the rest of it weren't too much for one person to bear, one of those 700 employees they haven't found is Howard Lutnick's own brother. My brother Gary. Yeah, he called my sister. Like, and we got lots, lots of people got phone calls. Probably a hundred people got phone calls after the, after the plane hit. You know, they called their family, they called their mother, they called their wife and said, you know, we've been hit by a plane and we're, we're evacuating. I mean, that was the common, common thread. My, my brother called my sister a little later and he said it was, the smoke was pouring in. There was no way out and he's not going to make it. That was just two days ago, this morning, after a moment of silence commemorating those who died. The U.S. financial markets started trading bonds again. Howard Lutnick says he asked his surviving employees what they wanted to do. They voted. Then they told him, let's go back to work. So they lost the person to their left and the person to their right, but they've decided that, that that's what they're going to do. And so this morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, my staff in Europe and here opened the U.S. government securities market, and I, I, it's a miracle, these people, I don't know, they're just, they, they, they didn't sleep. 
since losing all their friends, they didn't sleep once. They decided they wanted to go to work. Why would they want to go to work? But that's what they wanted to do. Certainly not what I asked them to do. And they're just, these people are just, these are spectacular people. Spectacular people. And in return, Cantor Fitzgerald's CEO made a promise to the families of the colleagues and friends who may be gone, but never forgotten. Within the company now, when we, you know, everything is different. It is everything different. But what it's going to be is we are going to, as a company, we are going to take care of and do everything we can mm -hmm. as a different business model to take care of the people, the families that we lost. Because it's not about us. I get to kiss my kid. I get to kiss my kid. But now I got people's wives calling me. They don't know what to do. I mean, I had a very young staff. Yeah. Their probably average age was the young 30s. That means they all have babies. They had babies. So we had a lot of people to take care of. We have a lot of people to take care of. A lot of people to take care of. And that's what we're going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what my staff is going to do. Because that's what we're committed to do. Dateline's Bob McEwen tonight on one company that lost 700 of its 1,000 employees at the World Trade Center.